jobs. And, and there are low-skilled, low-pay ones, all the way up to the high-skilled, high-paid ones. And they say, you're right, technology's really good at making new jobs up here, like a geneticist, high-paying, high-skilled jobs. But the bad news is it destroys the jobs down here, order taker at fast food. And then they ask this question, do you really think that person who just lost their job has the skills to do the job of tomorrow? And the answer is no, not at all, because that's not what happens. What happens is the biology, a college biology teacher becomes a geneticist, then a high school biology teacher gets the college job, then a substitute teacher gets hired on full-time at the high school, all the way down the line. The question isn't can this, can this person do the job of tomorrow? The question is can everybody do a job a little harder than the job they have today? And I think the answer to that is yes. And that's 250 years of economic history of this country. You see, I have spent a fair amount of time trying to figure out what the half-life of a job is. And I think it is 50 years. I think every 50 years, half of all jobs go away. For at least 250 years, I think this has been uh, the norm. And yet in this country, with the exception of the Depression, unemployment has never been over 10%. How can that be? How can we lose half the jobs every 50 years and never have systemic unemployment? I would even go further to say if, if I gave you 250 years of unemployment data across this wall and I said, uh, find the assembly line on there, find steam, you couldn't. It doesn't even budge because technology makes new jobs at the top, destroys jobs at the bottom, everybody shifts up, rinse and repeat. So. It is true, technology will eliminate jobs, probably 50% of them in the next half century. But the dominant metaphor of the future is definitely not going to be this. It is going to be this, because the situation we find ourselves in is that the number of opportunities of applying technology vastly exceeds the number of people we have to do it. So there's gonna be this huge shortage of humans in the future. You may ask, what are the skills that are useful in this world of tomorrow. I think about this a lot. My wife and I homeschool our four kids, that's them. Maybe in retrospect, we should have put one in public school as a control, <laughs> just to kind of see. And so I think, you know, they're gonna be on the workforce in the year 2100, at least. And I think, what can I teach them today that'll be useful in 2100? A world I cannot imagine. And, if, you know, the educational system we have right now is designed to create people for an industrial economy. It emphasizes homogeny. And the skills that you need are a little different. But they're skills that are commonly had. First of all is the ability to write. People didn't, my father's generation didn't write a word after they left college. We write all day, don't we? The ability to communicate in all forms, not just speaking. The ability to work in ad hoc teams with other people. The ability to read body language, to negotiate. But the super skill to have, the big one, is the ability to teach yourself new things. And this is something every human being can do. In fact, I will go further. If I went back in time, I'm 50 years old, if I went back in time to high school in the mid-80s, and I knew everything about the future, there's only one class I could have taken that would be useful to me today, and that is typing. That was it. And so I realized almost everything I do in my daily job, in one form or another, I taught myself and presumably you did as well. And the good news is that everybody can do that. That's what people can do so well. It is the vanity of every age to believe they live at the great turning point of all of humanity. That being said, we live at the great turning point of all of humanity. <laughs> we are the people that are gonna build the utopia of tomorrow. We're the ones who will deliver on all of those dreams. And it isn't because we're any better than anybody who came before us. It is that we were fortunate to be born on square 62 of the chessboard, the square 63. You know, the history of the human race, there was a time when we were down 75,000 years ago when we were down to 800 mating pairs of humans, give or take. That was it. We were an endangered species by any measure. 
Nobody would have bet that we would be the ones who came out on top, and yet here we are. And the reason we're here is because we learned a trick. Our bodies are only 100 watts of power, that's it. But we learned about technology, and we learned how to multiply that and do more with it. And that has been growing, and we find ourselves, as I said, up there on the top of the chessboard, and when things double, the history of the human race has been one of, there's never been enough of the good stuff. There's never been enough food for everybody, and there's never been enough medicine for everybody. There's never been enough education to go around, ever, because our story was one of scarcity. And we have finally reached this point where we can increase our productivity to a point that we will see the end of these, these things. I say this with the full understanding of all the pitfalls of technology. Now, of course, our great challenge is getting from the world of today to this world, building it, and understanding how we come together to make it. How do we bring about, how do we implement these technologies that increase human productivity so dramatically? Thank you very much.